organized by the Society for Tropical Ecology. Uh, my name is Melanie Damhan. I'll be your chair and I'm also a co-speaker of the scientific advisory board of the society. And um, we start to organize this, this online conference basically because we had no chance to meet physically. And now we want to give you know, loads of people a platform to talk and we will do this in a more kind of yeah, structured way to actually group talks to certain topics. And the topic of the day will be uh, animal plant interactions. Um, I will share my screen now for you to give you a little, does it work? No. No. So the whole seminar is organized by the Society for Tropical Ecology. And uh, so please give me the chance to have a little advertisement on the society before we start. <laughs> Uh, classically, we do conferences each year, international conferences each year, and uh, which were cancelled twice in a row. But we are very happy that we hopefully and very likely going to have a, a meeting next year in Montpellier that uh, we are busy organizing at the moment. And the meeting in 2023 is going to be in Prague and the one in 24 in Berlin. <laughs> The Society also has a, an own journal, the Journal of Ecotropica. It's a peer-reviewed uh, journal with no cost for publications in open access format. And it uh, also has a, is, is re recognized in all of the classical uh, citation platforms. Uh, we also offer a couple of grants, like travel grants or small research grants for, for student researchers and uh, prizes for talks and posters at, at conferences. And uh, quite recently, we also have uh, a very active tropical ecology student group that hopefully could be very attractive for PhD students, young postdocs to join, uh, which do a lot of social media activity and, and a lot of uh, further discussions on tropical ecology in general. For our tropical ecology online meeting today, uh, the topic is, as I said, plant animal interactions in tropical forests and beyond. Uh, the next sessions are also set up. Uh, the next one will be forest fragmentation on uh, August 8th and the one in September will be on pollination in tropical ecosystems. If you have further topics for, for seminars to continue this series, please get in contact with me via this email address at, at the bottom that you also received in your, in your um, letter. So feel free to propose topics. The classical format is that we group like three talks to one to one topic. And uh, today we have these speakers aligned. This is uh, Eckhart Heimann, uh, Omer Nevo and Elise Sivo. And uh, I'll start introducing the speakers very quickly now and then give them the word. And our format classically is that we have all the talks in a row and then we'll have a joint discussion on all of the talks together hopefully also fostering a bit of more general discussion to the topic and not, not just these uh, small questions to the talks, but if you have those, uh, please keep them as well. Uh, to interact, um, of course, uh, you can either raise your hand or the easiest is if, if you type a few question marks in the chat or type your question in the chat. Uh, please, uh, if the connection gets bad, switch off your videos, but for now, leave them on because it's much nicer for the speakers to see you. Uh, and please, everyone, shut off your microphones because this is going to disturb the speakers. So our first speaker is going to be Eckhard Heimann. Eckhard is uh, a senior researcher at the German Primate Center and professor uh, at the University of Göttingen. Uh, he's also director of an own uh, research station in the tropics in Peru. And Eckhart's main interests are, so they are quite broad, but uh, to keep it very short, he's interested in variation in social systems. He's interested in uh, animal plant interactions and in, in all kinds of primate ecology, let's put it that way, with a very strong focus on, on, on new world monkeys, as we are also going to hear today in his talk. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Omer Nebo, who is uh, the head of the emulator junior research group at the IDIF in Leipzig uh, for evolutionary ecology. 
Omer did his PhD with Eckhart Heimann, uh, already working on animal-plant interaction and the co-evolution of plants and, and animals, which he continues in his research now. Uh, and uh, after a postdoc in Ulm, he now has his own uh, junior research group in Leipzig. And our, our third speaker today is Elise Sivon, who is a PhD student in, at the University of South Bohemia in Czeszke Budewitscha. Uh, Elise did her master's in Paris at the Natural History Museum. And uh, after all these primate talks, Elise will speak about bats, primates, and carnivores, so a more kind of an overview uh, talk to the topic. And so I welcome our first speaker, uh, Eckhard Heimann, who will talk about small but nice patterns and consequences of seed dispersal by small new world monkeys. And I'll stop sharing, and then Eckhard, the Zoom floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Melanie, for this kind introduction. And now let me see whether I get this done, yeah. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so my talk will be on seed dispersal by small New World monkeys, an issue that I have been interested in since I did my first field study in 1985 in the Peruvian Amazon. And um, I will try to wrap up a little bit of the findings that we have made since then. Uh, this can only be a, a short overview. There's much more been done and partially published, partially uh, still partially unpublished data. Um, so this will give you a broad uh, overview of what we have done with some details, some old data, some new data. Um, yeah, and uh, I hope that this will give you a nice overview of how important small new world monkeys might be for seed dispersal. Maybe for those who are not that uh, familiar with the issue of seed dispersal, just a very short introduction into what seed dispersal is and how it happens. Seed dispersal is a process which is obviously critical for, in first place, plant reproductive success and fitness. It's actually the movement of the offspring of plants to other to a different place from the a source tree or source plant and by this it's also important for the natural regeneration of vegetation and uh, obviously through the transport of uh, seeds the gene flow uh, is maintained within a population of plants and there are different mechanisms of seed dispersal animals play a role as vectors for seeds in several different ways, either through endozoochery, where fruit pulp is consumed and seeds, seeds are swallowed and then regurgitated or avoided with a the feces. Then there is, this is endozoochery, then we have synzoochery, transport in, this, in the mouth, and this usually happens by scatter hoarding rodents who place the seeds at some uh, place for later use and what they forget might eventually then grow into a young plant and later into a uh, reproductive plant. And then epizoochoric seed dispersal, which is more a passive process where seeds attach to the fur or feathers or the outside of, of animals. And then there are other vectors, uh, the wind, the water, or there are mechanisms like autochory or ballistochory, where the plants themselves have some mechanisms to disperse the seeds. And why have I made this short introduction to the mechanisms of seed dispersal? Well, what is quite interesting is if we look at tropical woody plants, and I have examples here from two sides in the neotropics, but the same picture would emerge if you go to Africa. It would probably look a little bit different for Asia. Again, it looks very similar for tropical uh, Australia and for Queensland rainforest. What we see is that for trees and woody lianas, the majority of species receive seed dispersal service by animals. It's zoochory and usually it's endo or synzoochory uh, through which seeds of tropical woody plants are dispersed. And dispersal by wind, by water or through autochory is uh, only, um, has only a 
much minor importance as a seed dispersal mechanism in tropical woody plants. If we go specifically to the neotropics, we have four major groups of vertebrate seed dispersers, which are responsible for probably the largest fraction of seed dispersal of woody plants. It's on one hand primates, like the spider monkeys, it's bats, it's birds, frugivorous birds, and it's terrestrial frugivores like uh, this agouti here, but also tapers play a role, deer may play a role, and other terrestrial mammals, mammals that may feed on fruit and may eventually disperse seeds during fruit consumption. If we look uh, at different plant families in the neotropics, and here I have a nice uh, illustration from the thesis of Lika Futsesi, who compared or who analyzed the number of plant species per family, which are dispersed by primates only, by primates and birds, by primates and bats, by primates, birds and bats. You see that for a couple of neotropical plant families, primates are the single most important vector of seed dispersal. And primates are not only important then in terms of the number of plant species whose seeds they may disperse, but they are also important in terms of the amount of seeds they will disperse. There are no uh, comparative estimates, but if we look at the biomass of frugivores, and here particularly of mammalian frugivores. And mammalian frugivores usually have the highest biomass compared with birds, for instance, with, with frugivorous birds in neotropical forests. Then again, from two sides in the neotropics, primates account for around one third to around 45% of the frugivore biomass. And if animals have a high biomass, this also means that they use a high proportion of the available fruit biomass if they are frugivorous animals, which then also means that there is a potential for moving a large number of seeds. So there are good reasons to assume that neotropical primates are important as seed dispersal vectors. Neotropical primates have a range of body mass which is definitely much lower than the range of body mass we see in old world primates. It's a rel relatively narrow range from the smallest ones, the pygmy marmoset, which weighs around 110 gram, to the largest ones, spider monkeys, woolly monkeys, and borekis, which may weigh up to 12 kilograms. And one could easily uh, conceive that if you are larger and if you eat fruits, that if you are larger, then you eat larger number of fruits, a larger amount of fruits, and then you are probably also moving a larger uh, amount, a larger number of seeds. <coughs> so uh, this may mean, well, let's first look at the large primates. They move the largest number of seeds probably. They may be more important for the entire seed dispersal process in, an, in neotropical rainforest. Well, I guess the smaller primates, the small New World monkeys are also important and the reason why they may also be important and why one uh, could study them is that they may use resources that are not attractive or much less attractive or that are even not accessible to larger primates. And uh, small New World primates, particularly the calitrichids, the marmosets and tamarins, they may use secondary forests which large primates like spider monkeys or woolly monkeys would rather avoid. The small New World primates can even persist in disturbed habitats close to human uh, settlements. And what may be quite important, they produce rather small defecations. Our own studies were concerned with three different species of New World primates with two tamarin species, the saddleback tamarin, Leontocebus nigerifrons, and the moustache tamarin, Saguanus mystax, which have the nice um, uh, characteristic to four mixed species troops, so you can actually observe them simultaneously under basically identical conditions, so you don't have confounding factors when you want to compare these two species, for instance. And the third species that we also started to work with 
and where we have some preliminary data on C. dispersal is the coppery red Titimangui plectoral cebus cuprius. So you see these three species are rather small. They are towards the lower end of the spectrum of body mass in New World monkeys. Our research was uh, and uh, is conducted at the Estación Biológica de Rada Blanco in northeastern Peru. It's located something like 70 kilometers south of the major city of Iquitos in a largely uh, undisturbed uh, or relatively little disturbed rainforest. I won't uh, go into any details of the research site, but if you want to learn more about this, you can find information in the latest issue of Ecotropica on, on the EBQB. Our major advantage there, and uh, I think it is due to our policy of non-trapping and non-manipulating our study uh, subjects, uh, is that they are extremely well habituated. So we can pretty get pretty close to the tamarins and in the meantime also to the titty monkeys so sometimes up to 1.5 or 2 meters, which means that we can then also see very many details of their behavior. For instance, this titty monkey is spitting out uh, a seed, something you would not probably see if you have less habituated animals that maintain a larger distance to the observers. So we can actually observe what goes in, what the tamarins and the titty monkeys eat, and we can then also see and collect what comes out. We can see the animals defecating. And then with the help of local field assistants, which are really crucial for this kind of research, then we can collect fecal samples, like uh, here a single seed or here a, a, a defecation with many uh, small seeds. So uh, we have direct observations and we have the in information that we can extract from the analyze of fecal samples to make conclusions about the seed dispersal by these small new world primates. So our research questions, first of all, we needed some back baseline data. How frugivorous are they? Because if they have a very low degree of frigidity, they would not make much con of contribution, but actually they have a high degree, as you will see in a moment. Then what is the diversity of exploited and dispersed plant species? How effective is the seed dispersal process by the small New World monkeys and the seed dispersal the concept of seed dispersal effectiveness goes back to Eugene Schupp and it has quantitative and qualitative components and I will provide some examples for what tamarins do. Then we wanted to know what are the spatial patterns of seed dispersal, how far are seeds dispersed, which effects does tamarind seed dispersal have on plant population structure, and finally, we wanted to know whether this in any way uh, makes a contribution to the natural regeneration uh, of the forest, particularly of degraded areas. So let's first look at the, at the baseline, how frugivorous are these uh, small New World monkeys? And we see here the, uh, the diet budget, uh, the composition of the diet. And you see the two tamarind species, they have uh, a high proportion of fruit pulp in their diet and to which one can add the pot exudate from Parkia pots, which is functionally equivalent uh, to fruit pulp. So it's 80 to 85% fruit pulp plus pot gum that they consume. In the titty monkey it's a little bit less and they also uh, act as seed predators, but still uh, even the titty monkeys uh, disperse, uh, uh, consume around two thirds uh, of fruit pulp or have two thirds of fruit pulp in their diet. So how does this transfer into quantitative aspects of seed dispersal? Let's first look at the number uh, and proportion uh, of plant species that are exploited and dispersed. And here we have data from two different study periods, one from 1994-95. This is the study published by Christoph Knogge and me, and a study by the Belgium doctoral student, or ex-doctoral student, Laurence Culot, which took place between 2005 and 2008. And there was something worrying about 
because uh, the number of plant species exploited and the number of plant species uh, whose seeds were dispersed by the termites seem to have doubled between these two periods. Uh, fortunately, the proportion of uh, plant species that were dispersed remained more or less the same, 45, uh, 44, uh, 54 and 57 percent. And my explanation for this is that uh, Christoph Knogge and Laurence Coulot uh, cooperated with two different botanists, one being a lumper and the other being a splitter. And I guess uh, the real number of species is somewhere in between these extremes, 150 and uh, 300, and the same for the dispersed ones. For the tiddy monkeys, numbers are uh, apparently uh, lower, but uh, as I said, uh, the data for the tiddy monkeys are uh, rather preliminary, and we would have to do more detailed studies on their seed dispersal and on their feeding ecology to, to see whether they reach the same amount of plant species or whether in fact they remain with a lower number. Actually, tamarind seed dispersal is something that happens practically continuously. And we collected large numbers of fecal samples, as you can see here, 1,000, more than 1,000 for mustache tamarinds, uh, almost 1,400 for uh, saddleback tamarinds. And um, in around 95% of fecal samples, we found seeds and only the remaining 5% were without seeds. So it's something that they are doing continuously. Whenever they defecate, they disperse one or more uh, seeds to a place in the forest. Uh, and this compares rather nicely with larger primates like the spider monkeys uh, and the, the woolly monkeys, which also have something around 95, 98% uh, of uh, fecal samples that in, include seeds. So from this aspect, the uh, tamarinds are relatively comparable to uh, the, the large primates. What is probably quite different is that the tamarinds usually disperse very few seeds per defecation. So here we have the number of seeds per defecation and you see in most cases, both for the saddlebags and for the mustache tamarinds, we have a single seed or we have two seeds. This then looks like here, a single parkia seed that has been defecated. Uh, and there are relatively few uh, fe feces or fecal samples where a large number of very small uh, seeds are uh, included. So mainly they uh, defecate uh, one or two seeds. And uh, this sets them apart from the larger primates. If you look, for instance, at capuchin monkeys, they have uh, on average 2.8 seeds per defecation, which is almost twice uh, uh, as much as the mustache tamarinds. Uh, the spider monkeys, they have on average 30 seeds per defecation. And for howler monkeys, I couldn't find a number uh, per defecation, but a number per fecal matter. Uh, let's assume that um, howler monkey poo is something like uh, 20 grams, but I guess it's more, then you would still have uh, 20 or more seeds per defecation. And this obviously makes a difference for the seeds. If you land alone as a seed or together with one other seed, you may have no or little competition, but if you land with many other seeds, then you will necessarily enter into seedling competition in the case that all these seeds or majority of these seeds actually manage, manages to uh, grow into seedlings. And something I always must show because I'm still impressed and I still have no explanation. <laughs> and this is also a nice bridge to the talk by, by Elise who will deal with seed size and, and uh, morphological dimension. Uh, this is a seed from a Liana abuta uh, fumense, flumense, which is regularly dispersed by tamarinds. And here's a tamarind skull, and it's a larger tamarind species. I didn't have a skull of the smaller species and the mandible, and you see it's incredible. To compare with us, we would have to swallow an avocado seed, and obviously everybody uh, or nobody would be capable of doing so, maybe except from some artists who do, do seed swallowing, uh, 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 sword swallowing, sorry. Um, okay, so now let's look at 
uh, spatial patterns of seed dispersal. Usually uh, seed dispersal curves where you plot the probability of seeds against the distance from the source tree, you have a right skewed distribution and this is something we also find with the tamarins. And um, we see here on the upper two uh, uh, graphs, we see the, the saddleback tamarins and the lower graphs, the mustache tamarins from two different uh, study periods. And you see in all cases, we have this uh, strong uh, right skew of the seed dispersal uh, curve. So this is rather uh, typical for all kind of uh, seed dispersal by animals. But what is interesting that uh, the seed dispersal distances that they actually produce are so highly consistent over many years. We have here again the, we have here a cumulative percentage of the seed dispersal events against the dispersal distance and we have the uh, two large studies and another smaller one from 2013 that had a much smaller sample size. Um, and uh, it's highly consistent and 80 to 90 percent of seeds actually land within 300 to 350 meters of the source plant and 350 meters actually more or less half the diameter of a tamarind home range. And uh, there's also, uh, yeah, as I had already mentioned, the high consistency, not only between the tamarind species, but also between the different years. Um, the question then is, does this in any way affect uh, plant population? And one question that we asked, and I had a very nice cooperation with Birgit Siegenhagen from University of Marburg, which then was later continued for another uh, study with uh, Katrin Heer from the University of Marburg. Uh, but actually this study that I show you here, uh, was one of the first ones where we used plant genetic methods to examine seed dispersal by primates and we selected as a model system the legume tree Pachia panurensis and uh, our tamarins as seed dispersers and why did we do this? Well at our uh, study site in Peru the two tamarind species are actually the uh, exclusive, the only dispersers of this Pachia panorensis. At other sites in Amazonia, woolly monkeys may disperse these seeds, but at our sites, woolly monkeys pass through the area once every two or three years and do not even stop at the Pachia trees to feed. So it's really the, the tamarins who do it. So we have a system where we don't have confounding effects from other seed dispersal vectors. And what we did is we genotype uh, embryos, juveniles, and adult trees to find out about the um, uh, the spatial genetic structure. And actually, uh, we found that there is a spatial genetic structure at the different stages, at the embryo stage, at the juvenile stage, and at the adult stage. Please note here that negative values indicate a positive spatial genetic uh, structure. Don't ask me why this is the case. Uh, the plant genetists can answer this, or people working with spatial genetic structure uh, uh, specifically can answer this in, in more detail why this is the case. Um, the important thing here is that uh, on the embryo uh, stage, we have a significant uh, spatial genetic structure up to a positive genetic uh, structure up to 300 meters. This still persists on the juvenile level, but then if we go on to the adult level, the spatial scale is reduced to only 100 meters. We have interpreted this as uh, happening through reproductive thinning. It would need more detailed studies to find out in uh, what exactly is going on here, but it's relatively likely that uh, with increasing age, reproductive thinning takes place and uh, so, so the, uh, the spatial genetic structure at larger distances uh, is uh, lost then. And then uh, again to the consequences of seed dispersal, do the tamarids in any way contribute to natural regeneration, particularly to degraded areas or to secondary forest? And uh, the seed dispersal into secondary forests or degraded areas is obviously important for the long-term natural, natural regeneration of uh, such forests, particularly when it concerns 
species dispersed from primary forest to secondary forest or degraded uh, uh, forest. And we had a kind of unintended experiment in the area, namely in 1990, our, the owner of the area around the field site cut a buffalo pasture just 200 or 150 meters south of the, of the field station. And uh, he left a few single trees, but otherwise it was clear cut. And uh, it was used then only until 2000. And since then it uh, was regenerating. And uh, unfortunately we hadn't anticipated that this would, uh, could make for an interesting research question. So before, uh, in the earlier years, we didn't collect data on how this, on the steps of the regeneration. So we stepped on, in only later when our tamarins stepped in. They started in 2000 to spend a little bit of time in the secondary forest, first at the edge, at pioneer trees like Cecropia. And then at some point of time, when there was already some substantial regeneration, when there were already trees that they could travel in, they increasingly spent more time in the secondary forest, particularly during the dry season of the year in August, September, October. There was some variation between different years, which is probably due to El Nino events because the two peaks we see here in 2006 and in 2012, these were years uh, following uh, a large uh, El Nino event when the availability of ripe fruit in the primary forest was reduced. And uh, well, then uh, this is what Laurence Culot showed in her uh, doctoral thesis and which uh, was published then later. Um, seeds are moved into the secondary forest. The total number of plant species that the uh, tamarins dispersed in Laurent's study was 166. And of those, they dispersed 63 species, a little bit more than a third into secondary forest and the number of primary forest species dispersed in the secondary forest doesn't look very impressive. It's just eight, but still it's a number of species that are dispersed into this area. And uh, the number of seeds dispersed into the area are also not really impressive, but what I want to show here is that it actually takes place. So there is some proportion of the seeds that the terms disperse that is actually dispersed into the secondary forest. And then again, we looked at the Parkia panorensis, our model system, because we realized that within the secondary forest, the ex-buffalo pasture, we saw small seedlings and saplings of Parkia panorensis. And we sampled them, just 37, but uh, still, and did some genetic fingerprinting to determine the parent trees, the source trees. And we could then identify the potential, these are the potential source trees here, the dark uh, dots, and these here, the green triangles, these are the seedlings and uh, saplings. And uh, we could uh, match them to uh, two trees. It's impossible to distinguish which is the father and which is the mother, so we have always two candidate trees. And then we looked at the dispersal distances, the nearest potential or the nearest parent and the distant parent. And if you look here at the median distances, this is within the range 300 to 350 meters uh, where most of the seed dispersal by the terminals takes place. And again, I have to, uh, to reiterate, the terminals are the only seed dispersers of Parkia in the area. So these seedlings must actually be the result of seed dispersal by the terminal species into the secondary forest. So uh, let me uh, summarize and, and conclude. Small New World primates, and particularly the tamarins I have been uh, talking about in, in, in this lecture, is, uh, are, uh, they disperse seeds of quite a number of plant uh, food species. They, uh, their seed dispersal is a continuous process. They are doing it every day, uh, each time they defecate and they create largely consistent long-term patterns of seed dispersal, spatial patterns of seed dispersal. Um, this consistency obviously may influence the spatial genetic structure of plant species, but it would certainly warrant uh, studies on more different plant species that are also exclusively dispersed by the, uh, by the tamarins. And 
probably most important small new world primates, the tamarins, they disperse seeds from primary to secondary forest and thus contribute to natural regeneration. And obviously, there are, uh, as always, there are more questions that remain open and that could be addressed in, in the future. For instance, uh, how uh, do these small neotropical primates uh, fit into seed dispersal networks? How do they compare to birds uh, and uh, other seed dispersers? Um, how redundant or how complementary is the seed dispersal by small New World primates compared to medium-sized and large New World primate species, both on the level of individual plant species and on the plant community level? And uh, how effective is the seed dispersal process into the regenerating areas compared to the effectiveness within primary forest, but also compared to other dispersal vectors? And these are just a few of the uh, questions that are still around and that could be addressed uh, in future studies. So with this, I should like uh, to end. And I had already mentioned the field assistants and uh, they are shown here, the most, the, those who have worked for us most of the time. And without their work, any field study on these small new world primates would have been uh, impossible. So my, my acknowledgements goes in first place to them. And then to my PhD students, uh, to technical assistants who participated in the genetic analyze, to the uh, collaborators and to the organizations who provided financial support. And my thanks also to you for your attention. Yeah, thank you Eckhart for this uh, wonderful overview on seed dispersal and new world primates, which are obviously small, nice and important. And uh, as I said, we don't have a discussion now. I'll keep your questions, uh, keep a list yeah. uh, and we immediately go to our next speaker, which will be Omer Nebu, who will speak more, let's say, on the mechanisms of animal plant uh, interactions. And his title, you see already, Chemical Communication and Plant Frugivore Interactions. Omer, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so hi, it's really, really nice to have the opportunity to speak to you today. And today I would like to uh, present some of the work that I've been doing in the last couple of years on the role of, of chemical communication in mediating uh, plant frugivore interactions or interactions between plants and seed dispersers. So, uh yeah yeah so luckily Eckhart gave a really great overview on why seed dispersal is important and why it's such a big deal so i can uh skip it not that i plan to speak about it so much but uh yeah at least this is covered yeah so fleshy fruits as Eckhart said have evolved to be attractive to frugivores to frugivores in order to facilitate um seed dispersal and eventual plant reproduction it's a very important process especially in tropical systems and they have evolved to attract frugivores primarily by offering them some sort of a primary attractant, something that the frugivores are selected to, well, look after, uh, to look for things like uh, sugars and proteins and water, vitamins, uh, all sorts of things that are nutritious and are uh, required for um, animal survival and reproduction. Um, but in addition to these primary attractants, plants or fruits have also evolved sort of secondary attractants. Things that are not necessarily important by themselves to the animals that are not helping them uh, or some things that they should not be selected to look, uh, to look for, but things that have evolved to attract them to, uh, to the fruits. And maybe the best example for this is fruit color. We all know how colorful fruits everywhere, but especially in the tropics can be. Um, and we know that fruit color has evolved first to offer a strong contrast against background, which is often the foliage, the green foliage, uh, to allow animals to detect fruits and to identify them, to recognize that they are ripe. Uh, but we also have evidence that fruit color goes beyond this and shows animals, uh, tells some animals something about what's inside the fruit, what to expect once they take a bite. Uh, and that some colorful displays of fruits are correlated and are predictive of um, nutrient content in fruits. So the question that has driven uh, or that is behind most of my research in the past couple of years since I started my PhD with Eckhart 
already, uh, what was it, 10 years ago, I guess, is whether fruit scent, the bouquet of chemical signals that are emitted by fruits, uh, offers us sort of a parallel system to fruit color, whether fruit scent is also a communication system that allows plants to communicate with animals that instead of being focused on their vision, uh, tend to rely on their sense of smell, on their chemical senses. And the first study that I would like to show you to address this question, whether fruit scent is a signal for uh, animal seed dispersers, was conducted in Madagascar, uh, in East Madagascar, in Ranumafana. And in this system, we have two main dispersal syndromes. We have a majority of plant species that are relying on seed dispersal by lemurs. And then we have a more selective or smaller group of plants that do rely on the very, very um, poor, let's say, uh, uh, diversity of frugivorous birds on the island. And the reason that I wanted to compare uh, plants that rely on seed dispersal by these two uh, groups of animals is that they tend to be functionally rather similar or, or in, ter in terms of their sensory ecology. Uh, sorry, rather different, of course. So um, lemurs are mostly red-green colorblind. So uh, most species or many species are completely red-green colorblind. They can't distinguish red and green. And even uh, among those that do have some capacities, we're speaking about a minority of individuals that can distinguish. Uh, red and green, so the majority of individuals um, are red, green, color blind, and they have a good sense of smell, which we know is useful for many, many things that they do, from fruit selection to intraspecific communication, you know, mate choice and, and kin recognition, and all these uh, amazing things that they do. And then, it is, and then in contrast to that, uh, birds or passerine birds that are in focus here primarily, um, they are all diurnal. They tend to, to have an excellent color vision. They are tetrachromatic, so they have color vision that exceeds what we uh, humans, we primates, consider to be full color vision. And on average, they tend to have a lower uh, reliance on olfaction, on their sense of smell. So we have a, this dichotomy between animals that tend to rely on olfaction and are less likely to rely on vision, um, as opposed to animals that are on average, the opposite. They tend to rely on visual cues and not on olfactory cues. So um, if we try to test this hypothesis that fruit scent is an evolved signal for lemur seed dispersal in this system, we can come up with three main predictions, what we expect to see. Uh, first, if we look at the plants or at the fruits, what we expect to see is that in lemur dispersed species, um, ripe and unripe fruits are going to smell very differently. So the chemical profile of ripe fruits is going to be very, very different from the chemical profile of unripe fruits. Um, and this is important because without that, we cannot say that fruit scent contains any information on uh, fruit ripeness, right? If ripe fruits and unripe fruits smell the same, then you can tell anything about the quality or the ripeness level of the fruit uh, based on how it smells. The second point, since we are taking a comparative approach here, is that uh, in bird dispersed species, where we expect the selective pressure to, to signal ripeness through chemical cues to be much, much lower, we're not going to see this big difference in the ways fruit smell. And this is really important to show because fruit ripening is a very, very complicated pro process biochemically speaking. There are many, many things happening. The cell wall is degrading, uh, sec secondary compounds disappear, starch turns into sugar. So there is a lot of things, many, many things happening. And this by definition is going to lead to some change in the signature, the chemical signature of the fruit. Um, so it, it's important to look at the, at the bird dispersed species in order to, to show that this change in ripeness that we expect to see in lemur dispersed species is not simply the inevitable byproduct of fruit maturation, not something that happens in all fruits, but something that is uh, at least much, much more significant, implying that there is an additional selective pressure on the fruit to, um, to make themselves, themselves uh, more conspicuous to animals that they can smell them. And the last point that we have to show is that lemurs indeed use these chemical cues in order to identify ripe fruits so that we can really argue that we're speaking about some uh, communication system here. So to quickly show you uh, the, what I did to, to address the first two predictions, if you remember the idea was that or what we wanted to show that was that um, in lemur dispersed species, we're going to see this big change in the way fruits smell when they become ripe and that in bird dispersed species, they don't really, or they do so much less. 
Um, so what I did here in this study was to conduct chemical analysis using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry of ripe and unripe roots of 30 plant species from uh, Ranomafana from Madagascar. Uh, and I employed a paired design in which I compared the smell of ripe and unripe fruits, not just within a species, but within individuals. So I always looked at the change in ripe fruits within a single individual tree. Uh, and the idea is there was that, again, chemical, the chemical properties of fruits are affected by many, many different factors. It can be affected by soil and sun and antagonists and, and many, many factors that I couldn't even con uh, consider for this study. So the idea was to look at this pair design in order to basically remove all this noise from the system and uh, look at the change within individual uh, in order so that the difference between ripe and unripe fruits in this design can be more or less attributed only to the ripening process of the fruit. Um, so what I did was to analyze uh, the scent of the fruits and I came up with two indices of differences, chemical differences between ripe and unripe fruits. The first that we're going to see on the left uh, focuses on, on the amount of scent, so it's quantitative and rather ignoring the chemical properties. And the other one, uh, the chemical composition is exactly the opposite. It's a qualitative metric that ignores the amounts of smell that are produced or emitted by ripe and unripe fruits and focuses only on the, the tendency to rely on different chemicals. So let's start with the first one, the amount of scent. Um, so what we have here on the y-axis is simply the ratio in the amount of scent emitted by ripe and unripe fruits. Again, not only within a species, but within an individual tree. And we have the, on the left, the species that are exclusively or at least uh, to a large degree dispersed by birds. And on the right in blue, we have the species that are dispersed by lemurs. So uh, given that we're speaking about a ratio, the dashed line here marks one, so no change between, no increase, or no change between ripe and unripe fruits. And we can see that in the bird dispersed species, we basically don't see any change. Once fruits mature, the amount of scent, the amount of chemicals that they emit tends to be rather the same. Whereas in the lemur dispersed species, we have the significant increase in the amount of scent that they produce. Uh, the median number there is 2.7 something, if I'm not wrong, but it goes all the way up to a 76-fold increase in the amount of scent produced. So we, we, we see a first um, big difference between these two uh, dispersal syndromes. And then if we switch to the chemical composition, what we have here is, again, the, the bird versus the lemur dispersed species. On the y-axis, we have a, an index of chemical dissimilarity. So this is all... Um, this is all ignoring, or I, here what I did was to standardize the amount of the compounds, meaning that we're ignoring the amount of um, the amount of chemical compounds emitted by fruits, and we're focusing only on the tendency to recruit um, to recruit different chemicals, different chemical compounds in ripe fruits as opposed to unripe fruits. Again, of the same individual. Uh, so the numbers themselves, this is just an index; they are quite meaningless. But the point is the same that we see uh, significantly more. Um, Dissimilar, significantly higher dissimilarity in the lemur dispersed species as opposed to the bird dispersed species. So altogether, what it shows us is that not only that they tend to emit much more scent once they become ripe, uh, they also tend to recruit chemicals that are not present in the unripe fruits as opposed to the bird dispersed species that tend on average to emit again the same chemicals. And I'm not focusing on it here, but this is all also independent of phylogeny. So this appears to be um, something that evolved independently multiple times in the system. So these results show us that lemur dispersed species have this big shift in the way they smell quantitatively and qualitatively when they become ripe and that bird dispersed species don't really do that. They do so much less. Um, and this leaves us with a question whether lemurs use uh, fruit scent to identify ripe fruits and whether fruit scent is indeed a part of the communication system in this system. Um, and to uh, address this question, what uh, we did is to quantify their sniffing behavior. And sniffing is exactly what you think it is. It's the active sampling of volatile compounds. It's something that all mammals do. Uh, and it's something that the lemurs do in a very conspicuous way. I would like to show you a video. I hope it would work. I don't know if the quality is good enough, but what we see here is one uh, female lemur in Ranomafana feeding on a species that I've never identified. And I hope you can see that every time she 
uh, addresses an individual fruit, before she decides whether to ingest or to reject it, she gives it a little sniff and then she makes a decision. So this is an indication that she tries to gauge the quality of the fruit or the edible, the, well, whether the fruit is edible based on how it smells. So what we did was to quantify this behavior uh, in the feeding of several uh, of three lemur groups, uh, feeding on seven species for which we were also collecting chemical data at the same time. And the prediction that we came up with um, was that this reliance, reliance on scent, which we proxied by quantifying the sniffing, uh, would be correlated with um, the olfactory conspicuousness of ripe fruits, meaning that when they feed on species that give good information on how they smell in terms of basically changing the way they smell when they become ripe, the lemurs would be more motivated to, to try to gauge fruit quality by sniffing them. And we're going to see higher rates of the sniffing. Whereas in fruits that don't really do that, in, which, in fruits in which the chemical dissimilarity between ripe and unripe fruits is relatively low, so where ripe and unripe fruits basically smell very similar and there is not much information coded there, uh, they will be less motivated to do so. We're going to see less sniffing and probably more reliance on other senses like uh, touching the fruits or looking at them or just trying and see how, seeing how it goes. So very briefly, what we see here are the results of this analysis. What we have on the y-axis of both uh, graphs is the sniffing index. Uh, the higher you go, the more they tend to sniff the fruits. And then on the x-axis, we have on the left-hand side, um, the ripe unripe uh, scent ratio. It's basically what we saw on the left-hand side before. It's a tendency to increase the amount of scent uh, when fruits become ripe. And on the right-hand side, we have the, dis the chemical dissimilarity index. So this is the difference between ripe and unripe fruits when they become ripe in terms of their chemical properties and not the amount. Uh, the sample size is not huge here, but the uh, picture I think is rather clear. We see a very clear positive relationship between the two. Uh, so we see that the more plants, the more fruits change the way they smell when they become ripe, the more the animals are um, trying to assess fruit quality by sniffing them, the more they rely on their sense of smell when they feed on them which serves as an indication that the lemurs also use their sense of smell um, to identify ripe fruits. Um, so this gives us, again, an indication that fruit scent is not just um, a pleasant byproduct of fruit maturation that is there uh, due to all these biochemical processes that happen when fruits mature, but something that has a clear uh, ecological function. Uh, and has probably evolved exactly to, to fulfill this function. Um, and with this, I would like to jump to the next question that I'm uh, addressing or have addressed in the last years and still uh, playing with a bit. Um, and the question is what information exactly is coded in fruit scent? So the study that I've just shown you made a very simplistic uh, analysis or, or assumption on what fruit scent might tell animals. Uh, I assume that the fruit scent will tell us that the fruit is ripe or unripe and basically that's it. Um, but we know that fruit scent is a really complex um, trait. It's a, a product of hundreds, of up to hundreds of different chemicals that come from different biochemical pathways and are synthesized from different precursors. So we have a potential for a very nuanced message uh, that can go into this, into this signal. And we know, for example, that many fruit odorants are synthesized directly from nutrients that animals might be looking for, things like fatty acids and sugars. Uh, so this leads to the question whether fruit scent goes beyond this binary signal, ripe, unripe, and might be uh, an honest signal for fruit quality and for fruit nutrient content. And this is again in parallel to what has been described in fruit color in the last couple of years, where it was shown that uh, fruit color might signal um, fruit nutrient content, at least in some species. And when you look for this relationship between signal and reward, you can come up with several hypotheses uh, regarding relationships between different um, macronutrients, um, for example, in the pulp and uh, volatile compounds in the signal in fruit scent. But, um, oh, this is just repeating. Yeah, what one group of compounds that I'm particularly interested in and uh, focus on in my research uh, is aliphatic esters. And the reason that aliphatic esters 
caught my attention was that when I started analyzing the chemistry of the foods that I've just presented to you before, what I noticed was that chemical, the chemical profiles of foods ripe and unripe is chemically speaking rather boring. So what you see there is many, many compounds that are really, really typical um, plant volatiles. You see them in, in leaves and in roots and in and unripe fruits and really in flowers, of course. You see them really everywhere. It's nothing uh, special. And one group of compounds that did stand out a bit was these aliphatic esters. Uh, because they were, in, in, as opposed to most other compounds, they were common only in ripe fruits, or almost only in ripe fruits, and almost only in lemur dispersed dis species. So in the species that we assume are under selection to, to commu chemically communicate with C dispersers. So they are present exactly at the hotspot where you expect chemical communication to be, to be happening. And very briefly, esters are a product of um, acids and alcohols. And many acids and alcohols are direct give you the easiest example for this, um, ethanol, of course, an alcohol, and through oxidation, it can also become an acid. So this leads to the possibility that we have a clear biochemical link between a signal and reward, between what animals might be after and might what they could perceive uh, when they uh, sniff a fruit, when they approach a fruit and have to decide whether to consume it or not. Um, and to address this question, in what I did first, this is a uh, study that was published in 2019. What I did was to go back to the same data set uh, that I presented to you before, the same individual fruits uh, from which I luckily also collected nutrient content, and to look for this uh, association between esters and sugars, between signal and reward. And what I found, what we found in this study uh, is that indeed we see uh, a positive relationship. So this is a bit of a crude analysis, but what you see here is that uh, we have the amount of sugar on the y-axis, and then we have basically two groups of uh, fruits. Uh, sorry, the ones that are um, that contain at least some amount of esters in their scent, and the ones that don't. And you can see that the the ones that do um, that do emit esters are, are also significantly richer in sugar. So this gives us some indication that this is indeed the case, that esters and sugar are somehow linked, and that they might be an honest signal for fruit quality or at least for sugar content. But this study is um, in many ways very preliminary. Uh, primarily, if we think about it from an ecological perspective, this analysis is between species, meaning that species that are more sugary also have, tend to have esters. Uh, but if you think about it, ecologically speaking, it doesn't tell us much because uh, when we're thinking especially about these lemurs or other primates, um, they tend to be rather smart animals. They know what they're eating. They know the species they're feeding on. And the fact that a certain species is more sugary and also smells in a certain way is not necessarily helpful for them because they already know they, they repeatedly eat the same species and they would know that this species is sugary or tasty or nutritious. They don't need the signal or it doesn't give them any benefit. And this would be much, much more interesting if we find the same pattern within species so that animals can um, either discriminate between individual trees and know whether they give them better, um, higher, more, higher quality fruit, but also within tree, when you think about a group of lemurs or other um, animals uh, reaching a tree and there is uh, only a given amount of five fruits on the tree and there's a lot of competition between the animals, then there might be a real benefit in having the ability to quickly tell whether a fruit is ripe or unripe, uh, sorry, whether a fruit is, is uh, high quality or not so much. So uh, this is uh, what I would like to show you now is results that are unpublished yet, but that I collected um, exactly to address this question, whether also within species, we see this positive relationship between esters in the scent and sugar in the pulp. And again, between signal and reward. Um, so this is, in this study, what I did was to focus on a single species of figs growing again in Madagascar, in Ranomafana. Um, it is, I think, the most interesting species in the data set that I've presented before. This is the one that went all the way up to 76 Per, uh, fault increase in the amount of scent that these figs produce when they become ripe. So it seems like this is a species that is working very, very hard in using chemical, this chemical uh, communication channel to um, speak to the lemurs. Uh, and it's also very rich in esters. So it, 
I thought it was an excellent model system to, to address this question. Uh, and what I did here was to collect um, basically um, sugar nutrient content and the vox, the, the volatile organic compounds, the fruit scent of 80 figs from 15 individual uh, trees. And I came up with two predictions in this study. The first very straightforward one is that we're going to see a positive relationship between aliphatic esters, the signal and sugar, the reward. But another prediction that I came with uh, was that we are not going to see the same relationship when we look at non the non-ester fraction of uh, fig scent in the species. And the reason is that in this study, you cannot, you cannot uh, completely standardize the, the fruit ripeness level, let's say, when you sample. You sometimes might sample figs that are uh, later in their ripeness uh, in process and some that are earlier. And it could be that this might drive a lot of the variance that, that more ripe fruits would emit, would have more sugar because more starches uh, turn into sugar, but also um, they, have, they emit more volatiles just because they are riper and all these processes push all these volatiles out. And in order to, to address this problem and to remove the possibility that the relationship between signal, between esters and sugars is simply the product of being uh, later on the maturation um, process, I also, I, I wanted to show that this relationship does not exist for volatiles that are not esters. Yeah, in order to show that this is really, um, that this relationship is unique to, to this one chemical compound or to one class of chemicals that is biochemically linked to, to the presence of sugar. So um, the results that I got, and we start to reach the end of this talk. Um, first, I looked within, sorry, between individuals at the relationship between esters and sugars, or sorry, between chemical compounds in the scent and sugar. Uh, and what we have here on the X axis is the amount of sugar in fruits and each dot is an individual tree. So what we have is an average of the amount of sugar, for example, in each tree in, the figs of, uh, in all the figs that I sampled of each individual tree. And on the y-axis, we have uh, a standardized amount of, uh, of the chemical compounds that we found. Uh, either in blue, we have the esters and in black, we have all these non-esters. And the pattern is very, very clear. You can see that we have a, a positive relationship between uh, sugar and esters, meaning that individual trees that have more sugary figs also emit more esters, but they do not emit more of anything else. Um, and this pattern also repeats when we look within individuals. So what we have here in these graphs, uh, instead of every, each dot is not an individual tree, but an individual fig, and the different colors depict different individual trees. So for example, all the purple uh, dots are figs of the same individual tree. And when what we have again on the x-axis, we have the sugar and on the y-axis, we have on the left-hand side, the amount of esters and on the right-hand side, the amount of non-esters so of chemical compounds in the scent that are not esters. And the pattern is basically uh, the same. So what we have is that uh, we have a, a significant positive relationship between sugar and esters, meaning that uh, an individual fig, if it has more esters in the, in the scent, of the fig, it also tends on average to have more sugar even within individual tree. But this does not repeat when we look at the non-esters. So they have nothing to do with the amount of sugar or they do not signal the fruit quality at all, showing that this is not really just uh, the fruit being more ripe. Um, yeah, so these two predictions are met and this gives us some indication, at least in a single model species, um, that fruit scent is an honest signal for fruit quality and that esters, given their biochemical link to sugar, uh, they signify fruit quality to, to these lemur seed dispersers. Uh, yeah, and with this, I would like to thank, uh, of course, all the, everyone who helped doing the project and funding agencies uh, and you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Omea, for this, uh sensory ecology journey into the animal plant interactions. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so we will, without any ado, we will jump immediately to our third speaker today, which is going to be Elise Simon, and she's going to talk about body mass and skull dimensions, predict seed dispersal capacity in bats, primates, and carnivores from tropical forests, and this is part of her PhD thesis. Elise, 
the floor is yours. Yes. I the presentation. If you, yes, please go. Okay. Hello, everyone. So today we'll talk about my master topic, which is a bit different, still talking about plant animal interaction. But uh, if we can predict these interactions from morphology of mammals. So this work comes from important collaboration. So you can see here my co authors listed. And to introduce this topic, I will briefly talk about the frugivorous mammals. The first one is primates, as Eckhart presented already. There is catarines, strepsirins in old world and platyrins in new world. They have very diverse behaviors for seed handling and fruit handling. And they represent very high biomass in tropical forest. Yes, would you switch on your video, please, that we can see you? Yes. Yeah. So the second group is bats. I'm currently working on bats for my PhD, but for master, I'm working on the frugivorous bats only, theropodidae in old world, philostomidae in new world. They are also important dispersers. They ingest small seeds and disperse them, but also carry large fruits, so maybe disperse also large seeds. And the third group I studied was carnivores. So carnivores are less studied as uh, frugivores and dispersers, but they are recognized are essential in tropical forest. And you can find viveridae in old world and prosunidae in the new world. So for these three groups, we have data on their abilities to um, foresee dispersal. But what about, oh, is it working? Yes, what about extinct species? So for example, here you can see, yep, you can see Arcoelemur or Adopithecus. Both are subfossils, so they are extinct primate extinct species. And um, researcher using stable isotopes made inferences on their diet and using their skeletons, they made inferences on their habitat or behavior. But I'm wondering if we can do inferences on their seed dispersal abilities. And what we have of these species, what information we have is their body mass that have been estimated and their schools. So I try to answer one big question. Can we predict the seed dispersal abilities of mammals from morphological data? So for that, I went to two museums, one in Paris and one in London, and I made measurements on schools of several extant species. So you can see here all the measurements I made. And I did the same on scans of uh, some extant species. I also use a huge tree uh, to, to find the phylogeny of these species. Then I compiled many data on seed and fruit. So you can see here an example. So in the top part are the mammal species, left part are the plant species, and the cross represent the seeds that have been ingested by the species. So in total, I, I compiled uh, data of 100, 100 mammal species, 42 bats, 46 primates, 12 carnivores. And in total, it was more than 1,000 plant species where the seeds have been ingested or the fruits have been consumed. And this data came from three continents, Africa, Asia, and um, America, South America and Madagascar. And to be, to be clear, um, I use data on seed ingested, so they have been dispersed by endosocory only. And to get further, I compile data on seed dispersal distances and transit times. However, uh, I found enough data only for primates, for 16 primates, but the sample size were too small for bats and carnivores. So they have been excluded for these relationships. So don't be afraid about this graph. They are quite big, 
I will explain it slowly. So uh, here you have the first relationship between body mass and seed and fruit sizes. So in the bottom part, you have morphological data, body mass and school dimension, and the left part are seed and fruit sizes. In the middle, you have the, the pattern. So basically for 80 species, I found covariation between body mass, seed length, seed width, average and maximum, as well for fruits. So what you, you have to remember is that Larger is um, is a frugivore. Larger the seeds are uh, the ingested seeds are. I did the same analysis only with school dimension, so I, it's without the confounding effect of uh, body mass. And as well, I st I found a stronger pattern between uh, five school dimensions and the seed and fruit sizes. And uh, especially between there is correlation between um, the distance between molars, the jaw gap, jaw length, and the canine overlap. So basically, we have uh, the frugivores are constrained by their school and more specifically by the passage, uh, the passage of the food. So uh, as you saw before, I use only 80 species out of the 100 species I uh, compiled in the data set. So with the 20 species left, I made predictions. I checked uh, my predictions. So with the yellow dot, the yellow dots are um, the observed data. And for the same species, I made the prediction with a relationship we can see in very light green. And what is important is, can we, uh, how, do we have differences between our predictions and the observations, which means the literature, from the literature. And it's not significant. It means the predictions are quite accurate and quite uh, close to the reality. So I use, uh, I use body mass as a predictor for extinct species. And from their body mass and school dimension, I was able, for example, to uh, predict the seed, seed length and seed width of Adopithecus. And uh, for example, apparently they can uh, ingest up to two centimeters long and 1.3 large. And this can be tested out of, with any extant species. And to go further, so as I said before, I use seed dispersal data. So I made again covariation between school dimension and body mass and seed dispersal distance, average and maximum, and transit times, average and maximum. And for that one, we can clearly uh, see that body mass covariate with seed dispersal distance and transit times. Basically, gorilla, for example, gorillas are uh, large primates. They can uh, disperse seed further away than tamarinds. I repeat the same analysis, only with cool dimensions. And we found a relationship, a strong one, with a uh, um, distance between molars, again, jaw length, coronoid eight. But uh, to explain this relationship, we need further studies to, uh, to understand how primates manipulate or like how can the school can be uh, linked to the seed dispersal distances. And I was also wondering, so, sh so should we use body mass or school to make predictions? Apparently, they are not significant. It's not significant between uh, the two predictions, which means we can use body mass or school uh, as we want. And I, it's what I did for extinct species. So for this example, I use body mass as predictor. So again, for Adopithecus, I found that they can disperse seed up to five kilometers. 
However, we uh, noticed overestimations, for example, for Aculemo Eduardi. Here you can see the transit time estimated is 82 hours, which is almost three days, which is very uh, overestimated. So I guess we need very precise measurement for extinct species. Unfortunately, uh, the measure we got was body mass estimations from the skeletons and also we have less individuals to measure which can make a big difference as well uh, sea dispersal distances uh, depends of many many parameters which can be a bit harder to to predict nevertheless we can say that body mass and school dimension are very good predictors for seed and fruit sizes so they can determine like the key species in tropical forest if we have very limited information on these species, but also estimates uh, the ecological role of species from the past and maybe their impact on forest structure, which means that if they were able to ingest larger seeds, maybe the trees were, uh, were having larger seeds. So basically, it provides a, a basis for predicting the consequences of frugivore extinction within tropical forests. So I would like to thank you first, uh, where I, I, I've done my, uh, my master. It was in Mekadev Research Unit in the Natural History Museum of Paris, also the Natural History Museum of London, and my uh, current uh, PhD uh, place, as well, of course, my co-authors and my collaborators on this project who helped me with data, with statistics, and of course, like, help me to find new ideas. And of course, I want to thank you, Society for Tropical Ecology, for organizing this, uh, these talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise, for sharing these results, in particular, this journey into the past. We are now at the discussion time, and uh, please, people, whoever has a question, raise your hand here or write it in the chat or type some question marks in the chat. Uh, we already had a question by Jonathan Neumann. If you are still with us, please ask. Uh, uh, more with the morphological, I'm not that into it. This is the very first talk, so the so one and um, Kevin who is able to swallow uh, avocado seeds for our relation. Do they have any specific um, adaption in the intestinal system? Because I would imagine if we swallow uh, uh, avocado seeds, we get a damper schluss, which is not very positive for us. So there must be an ad adaption or how do they solve it? I guess the question was for Eckert. Yeah, do you yeah for Eckert, if, if there's any specific um, yeah, adaption in the Verdauungstrakt for them. To, to handle these big seeds. Uh, unmute your microphone. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I just, uh, my, my screen was frozen and I only heard part of your question. I think you, what I heard is whether they have any specific adaptations to swallow these large seeds. Yeah, because yeah. if we would swallow no. avocado seed, we would get a Darmfallschluss or would get sick, yeah. Yeah, pro probably. I'm, this is still one of the most amazing things of tamarind seed dispersal, how they manage to swallow these uh, large seeds without uh, getting harmed. I mean, there have been, that's been a paper that, pre that postulated by Paul Garber, that postulated that the tamarins would do this in order to get rid of prostenorsis, which is a, a very harmful intestinal parasite. But uh, this doesn't make much sense pre because prostenorsis attaches itself very firmly to the gut wall and it wouldn't be expelled by a seed. Um, what may be true that for the Germans it's a kind of roughage and they don't do it in captivity. You can order some fruits with very small seeds and they don't, they separate the small seeds, which they would never do in, in, in the wild probably. Um, and the most common problem uh, of captive Germans is gastrointestinal diseases, uh, gut inflammations. And I guess uh, this is the lack of, of roughage that they are suffering in captivity. But no, I'm, there, nobody has uh, looked at uh, whether there are any specific adaptations to this. From what I know, there's nothing 
particular about their gastrointestinal tract. It's typical tract of a small frugivorous insectivorous mammal. And do they swallow the fruits whole or do they chew on them with these big seeds? No, they, they usually swallow the seeds along with the pulp attached to the seeds. Okay. Uh, uh, this is probably a strategy to, to take up a lot of seeds along with the pulp within a short period instead of remaining exposed in tree canopies and separate, meticulously separating the pulp from the seed. It's probably less risky to swallow and then move away again and mm. digest instead of separating it in Z2. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, I see question marks by Ute Radespiel. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to all the speakers for these very nice presentations. And I have two questions for Oma. Um, I was wondering about, you, you showed there is a positive correlation, I think if I got it right, between sniffing intensity and olfactory stimulus that is emitted from the plants. And I was, so my first question is, uh, I found it, find it a bit counterintuitive because if something is already smelling a lot, why should you sniff a long, a long time or a lot? If you already perceive it easily, should you not sniff a bit longer if it's more subtle, the smell? And the second question would be if you guess that there's also something like a multi, multimodal advertisement that plants are doing. It's, it, it's because it sounded a bit like it's either the smell or maybe it's the outer appearance, but could it not be both that is the best push for, for getting your disperser? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the questions. So for the first question, what we measured, there was not the duration or the length of this uh, sniffing, but the, the frequency of sniffing on individual fruits. It's basically whether uh, an individual fruit is sniffed or not sniffed, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and this is a different story because the idea is that, well, you know, the signal, even if it's there and it's a good signal, it doesn't mean that you see it from or you smell it from a kilometer away. You still have to, to try to, to perceive it. To sample it. So uh, the more likely you are to get useful information from doing it, the more likely you are to do it. And if there is no information there, think about it this way. You go to the supermarket before COVID times, before you had a mask and you, were, and you felt comfortable touching everything. Some, some fruits, you know, you can gauge your quality by sniffing them like melon. So you would go and do it. And some fruits, you know, it's meaningless. So we just don't do it at all. Yeah. So I think that this is more or less what they're doing there. Uh, yeah, but again, it's the frequency. It's the tendency to do it, not um, not uh, not the length or the duration. Which, in which case, I would agree that if you already decided to do it to to a fruit that gives a lesser quality signal, you would have to do it for longer. But I'm not sure that you would waste the time. And this, of course, goes to your second question. That I mean, yeah, I focus here in this case on on chemical signals and and. The, what we see there, it's obviously not only chemical signals, yeah, the, the animals use all sorts of different um, properties of fruits to decide what to do, yeah, there is no doubt that there is some tactile cues involved, there is uh, no doubt that there's some visual cues involved in some of the species, um, but these things, so first they can work in concert, and again, there is variation between individuals in terms of what they can do, because in some species, we would have some of the females that are trichromats. They have color vision that is similar to, our, to ours and can distinguish red and green. And presumably they would be less likely to rely on chemical cues and others not. Um, and multimodal communication can also, uh, it's not necessarily redundant. So you could have visual cues that help the animals uh, focus on the tree, find the tree, and then chemical cues that help them to select the trees the fruits within the tree, so it's not, not uh, completely redundant. But it um, has not been tested whether it improves detection performance if you offer different uh, stimuli on top of each uh, other. Not, not with them. It's, this is sort of experiments that many pollination ecologists did with, with flowers and insects to see if the combination of visual and olfactory cues elicit a stronger response. Uh, with animals, not so much. Now, we had another study. I don't want to just throw, tell you the results because I'm not sure now. I'm trying, I have to think what we did. This is a study that I did with um, Amanda Melin in Capuchins, so a completely different model system. But there we tried to, to integrate this uh, color vision because there as well you have this uh, polymorphism within the species in which we have individuals that are dichromats and trichromats. 
And if I'm not mistaken, we found that there is a rela uh, that the trichromats are sniffing fruits less. So the dichromats tend to rely more on uh, dichromats because because of their deficiency, tend to rely more on chemical cues. But to be honest, I uh, this I uh, now I, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm at least slightly mischaracterizing my own paper. So please go and, and have a look at the abstract. Yeah. Okay, I don't see more questions. Anyone has one? Pressing one right now. I see Eckhart raising his hand and I see Jackie. So let's go for Jackie and then Eckhart. <laughs> Um, just to add on uh, uh, to Omer's answer, uh, in a previous study, I think Amanda uh, showed that uh, the combination of sniffing and, and all, of olfactory and visual cues of sniffing and, and uh, the role of, of vision depends on how conspicuous the fruits are. And with very conspicuous fruits, which are less cons obviously conspicuous to the trichromats, not to the dichromats, there's more sniffing in the dichromats, but those fruits that are dark and less conspicuous, the dichromats don't need the additional cue. So it, it's, it's a complex interaction, as you already said, and I'm, I'm looking forward to see your new findings. Um, then my question to Elise, um, I mean, you mentioned these, you modeled these dispersal distances, but I think one thing that you need to emphasize is that these are the maximum dispersal distances uh, that could be achieved if the animals moved linearly. This is very important because uh, usually primates and other mammals do not, use, do not walk in a straight line once they leave a, a feeding tree. So this is the potential, but it doesn't uh, tell about the, the, the actual uh, distances. And um, then my, my question in your data set, did you come across any other uh, mammal where uh, the uh, yeah where there's such a, a discrepancy uh, between the size of the seeds and the size of of the animals like in 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 the tamarinds uh yeah absolutely for the previous question uh what do you mean the paper <laughs> I guess if one plots uh, a regression line of seed size versus the dimensions, uh, then the tamarins would fall above the regression line because they can swallow seeds that are larger than one would expect given their body size. And my question is, uh, if you would do this, would there be uh, other mammals, other primates or other uh, bats, perhaps not, but then proteonids, uh, which also swallow larger seeds than one would expect for the for the given body size. No, uh, no, I think I saw that only in tamarinds. Mm. I didn't read any papers uh, where, like, the expectation are above what uh, what they saw. No, no, no. <laughs> only tamarinds so far. Okay, thank you. So the next next question is by Jackie, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just had a question just to follow on to the question that was asked to Uma about the scent of the fruits and the amount of sniffing that the primates um, were doing to detect the different um, fruits. And I was just wondering if maybe actually if you have a large bunch of fruits that all have very strong scents, that actually the monkeys might need to sniff even more to find the individual fruits within the large bunch but are actually the ones that are emitting the strong scents are actually the ones that are ripe. And I just wanted to hear what you might think of that. Yeah, I think it's a really good point that um, yeah, I actually haven't considered, but I should have because um, once you switch to within species analysis, what, we showed, what I showed before was a between species analysis where I think the prediction that if there is a signal, you would try to get something out of it uh, and you would sniff more is, is, uh, is the right one. But what you say is that within species, you, again, you have variance within the species and you have variance in the quality of the signals and the quality of the fruits. And if we have a relationship between the two, then yeah, I guess you can predict, you can make the prediction that uh, more sniffing uh, would be associated with more, actually, I'm not sure, with more sugar. But why? Why would you predict that? Or did I misunderstand you? I'm just thinking that if you have um, a large 
um, bunch of fruits that are of yeah. different ripenesses and um, it's a species that has um, a strong scent okay. but then for your mammal to detect which are the individual fruits that are the ones that are particularly ripe that might be the ones that are particularly letting off a stronger scent that they might actually need to sniff that bunch of fruit more to find those individual fruits within the bunch that are actually the ripe ones okay. rather than the less ripe ones yeah yeah i guess i guess i guess this this would happen yeah so yeah you could look if if um for example in species that you have like you say a bunch of fruits a species that are synchronously ripening you have more and you have more mess in the fruit and you have to to work harder to figure out what's going on there then yeah then then you would do it yeah thank you generally speaking that, I, sorry sorry I, I was just thinking that because my initial thought was that mm -hmm. If it was a strongly scented um, um, fruit you know, with a species that has strong scents, you would not yeah. need to um, sniff it as much because it's a strong scented fruit. But then I was just thinking, maybe actually because it's strong, and then there's some that are not um, ripe within the same bunch if they aren't all synchronized um, in their ripening, that then yeah. actually more sniffing might actually be needed. Um, yeah, yeah, it's possible. I mean, I think anyway, even strong scented. Um, I think that most of the chemical communication is happening in the for selection of the individual fruit, and not so much for anything beyond that. And therefore, yeah, regardless of, of how many you have there or the strength of the fruit, you would have to do it if there is what to gain from doing it um, at the individual fruit. But I, I, I agree that you might have to do it more when there is more noise around you. If it's a strong scented fruit and if there's more, more ripe fruit around you, um, then yeah, it's, it's possible. Okay, thank you. But I don't know. There are more questions. I might have one for Elise and then uh, Pierre Michel. Uh, Elise, like if you use your relationships now, then you can basically predict what the seed size, fruit size of these extinct lemurs are, right? So if you turn this around now, you could basically also analyze which species lost their primary seed dispersers in, in these Malagasy forests. Has anyone done this, uh, like looking at the, the, the plant perspective and, and asking which species lost their seed dispersers? And do we need to do something about it? Yes, it has been done with, uh, from body mass actually that because uh, frugivores tend to be smaller and smaller with time, the seeds as well is like the trees are selected kind of <laughs> select uh, seeds smaller as well. So of course there is, there is some papers talking about modification of forest structure with the size of frugivores, but not related to school dimensions. Okay, thank you. Pierre-Michel, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, as president of the society, I would like to thank you, everyone, to, for organizing this uh, Tropical Ecology Online and uh, thanking uh, all the people who are contributing and who are listening. That's, uh, and uh, welcome, uh, we welcome you in Montpellier, hopefully uh, next uh, June in, in France. I have a question for Omer. Uh, and, uh, do you correlate the, the, the volatiles with uh, the type of fruits? Uh, I think to the capsule or droops or uh, dry fruit eventually. And are esters or volatiles more frequent in one type than in the other, where the colors can be also interacting with the choice of fruits? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have not really analyzed anything there with regards to the type of the fruit, but I did, all of the fruits here are fleshy fruits or pseudo fleshy fruits like figs. So uh, it is, they're all functionally rather similar. I don't have dry fruits and, and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, and then all of all are in the his and none of them are the ones that, that uh, open at some point. I guess they will be different. Um, yeah. yeah, so so there, there I, ca I can't tell you much. Um, yep. Okay. And then with regards to the color, I didn't have enough data to analyze it because, well, the data set was not big enough to, to connect it, but I do see some signals that there is a negative relationship between the visual signal and the olfactory signal, which would make sense, I think. 
Uh, although I, I, it's not strong enough for me to say it uh, on the record, I guess. I see that it's recording still. Yes. Um, yeah, I think, I think that this might be the case and it's something that would require a bigger data set to, to look at because again, there are many, many variables here. It's not straightforward negative relationship because, because this multimodal communication might, uh, might be directed at different animals or might uh, have non-redundant messaging like color uh, attracting the group to the tree and then scent helping them choose within the tree. And then again, this would reduce the strength of the negative correlation. But I, I have a feeling that it's going to be there in the end. Thank you. Thank you. I would also have a question for Omer if I don't see anyone here. Um, like if I, if I get it all right, you basically argue that uh, the plants are honestly signaling fruit seed quality to the to the animal right and uh, the, the beneficial part for the plant is that a high quality seed then gets eaten gets dispersed right but uh, what's the cost what's the cost of producing this signal so is there really a trade-off between producing this a star as a signal to signal to the animal eat me um, like for the plant basically do they have to trade this off against um, the compounds that they actually need for germination. Yeah, so uh, I, I can tell you what I can speculate here. And these are two PhD projects that I'm now starting with students. The one cost that is possible is that uh, the better you communicate your quality, the more likely you are to attract your enemies. Um, so the, the animals that feed on the foods but do not disperse the seeds, they're also likely to pick on these things and to be selected to uh, identify these signals. So this is one cost that, that, is, uh, that is there. And then the second cost that again is, is completely speculative, but it's something that I'm, I'm thinking about is that if you think about this relationship between sugar uh, and esters, there's something in the middle and it's, it's the fermentation of sugar to alcohols. And this is often done by microbes. And these microbes are destroying the fruit. They're competing with the frugivores for the sugar because their interest is to consume all the sugar and to not to be eaten by anyone, of course. So it's possible that the plants allow some microbi microbial activity to happen in the fruit in order to get these fermentation products that allow them to produce the uh, chemical signal. Uh, and that without them, they would have uh, even potentially a higher quality fruit, but lesser ability to communicate it. And it's something that, again, we see a bit in nectar, uh, in nectar mainly, and in flowers, that you have, you have fermentation and you have volatilization of the fermentation product in order to, uh, that produces um, basically esters and attractive uh, compounds that bring pollinators. So it might also be a cost. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there more pressing questions to our three speakers? If I don't see any more, I don't see any raised hands, I don't see anything in the chat. So thanks again for presenting. And thanks again for this very active discussion. Thanks everyone for joining and just listening as well. And uh, please join me in a round of applause again, at least a virtual one for our speakers. That, and now I can tell you the secret, they all, um, said yes to present for this meeting within a couple of seconds uh, after me asking them last week uh, because we had a bit of a trouble with our speakers. But so a big, big thanks again, to all the three speakers that you made it that spontaneously and really filled us a very interesting seminar on tropical ecology again. And we all see each other.